Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Myers. I'm the global VP of our solution consulting team here with Lineate. And this is going to be a little bit different context uh, for the discussion today. A uh, couple of ways that we look at this problem slightly differently uh, than some of the discussion that's come along from here. Um, the first one I'll point out is we refer to uh, the identities as a person uh, rather than a patient because they really can span a multiple uh, number of scenarios and use cases where they're being interacted with. So that same patient in that context may also be a physician or a nurse or a, a member of the, the facility um, that the hospital is dealing with. So they have a variety of different roles that they may encounter. Um, so there's a number of different sources that can be uh, taken into account um, for that context as well. And I'm also going to drive the, the presentation today with the perspective of how do we do this at scale, and how do we do this uh, for a variety of different use cases, uh, including uh, de-identification uh, for those training and research use cases that were mentioned earlier. Um, so starting out, uh, you may not know the name Lineate. Um, so I'm going to start out with who is Lineate, and then who am I? Uh, I'm Tom Myers, as I mentioned. I've been with the organization about two years. Um, we recently rebranded at quite possibly the worst possible time, uh, which is right when COVID was kicking off and starting. So uh, historically, we've been known uh, by a couple of names in the integration space, um, mainly the Rhapsody uh, integration engine and the CorePoint integration engine. And through a variety of uh, acquisitions in the last several years as well, uh, we've added um, the Nextgate um, EMPI solution to our, our suite that we provide, as well as the CareCom um, terminology services from health term as well. Uh, so this is a picture of Norway with our, our corporate swag with the new name. So uh, if you don't recognize the name, uh, don't be too surprised. Um, overall, uh, we've been in the business for quite a while. We're about 40 years combined in the healthcare um, space, cover the globe, uh, 60 different countries. Uh, we're growing. Uh, current uh, headcount is on the order of 400. So the slide is slightly out of date. 24-7 uh, global support, all of that. Um, we're 100% health care focused, and we are primarily looking at how do we solve the problems of getting data to the places that they need to. Um, and some of the numbers that are not on this slide in the EMPI space specifically, uh, we're currently sitting around 50 installs, and those installs currently cover about um, between 350 and 400 million lives, depending on how you want to count it and how those are covered. Um, so we deal with this on a daily basis, and it's part of what we deliver uh, into those enterprises today. So the solutions as a whole that we talk about, we talk about it in terms of being a suite that can provide a collection of capabilities. Um, and we have a number of partners uh, that we work with. We have solutions that we provide. I'm not going to sell this today. I'm just giving a context for what we do. But the way to think about it is we sit in the middle, and we help with that mapping and that flow of data. Um, so it's populated uh, and it's cleaned up and it's moved along in the way that it needs to be to deliver the care that's being delivered on a daily basis. So for the discussion today, um, why I really want to talk about this is what are the use cases around using those longitudinal records? Why do we do it and why do we need them with and without anonymization? And if so, um, why do you, how do you generate that anonymization in a way that makes it um, useful in those longitudinal um, perspectives. So talk about how we do this in the real world. How do we federate the person records? How do we do that and propagate the identity um, through a single best record? And then dealing with those automatic and also manual deduplication steps as well. So a lot of the discussion so far has been the automatic processes of how do you do matching. The real world that we've encountered with it is that gets you so far. Uh, but when you're delivering care with it, you really do need to have a human intervention at some point. And a lot of the tooling and the infrastructure and the expertise that we've developed, as you're looking at balancing those weights, you have to do that in a way that is re re uh, reflective of the specific region or, or area that you're in. Um, so you can imagine the weights that you would have in uh, one country may vary differently than the weights that you would have in another country, where first name may have a different set of uniqueness or um, address may have a very different meaning as well. So lots of variety there. And depending on the install, you drive the weights in a way that makes sense um, to optimize it for the workflow you're trying to do. And then lastly, how do we do um, de-identification and how do we actually deliver that in a way that's useful for the types of training and the types of logic that we're looking at doing? 
Um, this talk is going to be very high level, so just moving into that as well. First question is, why do we need longitudinal person records? And I'm assuming if you're on this call, this is something you're dealing with today. So I'll give the snarky answer as to deliver better care. Um, the person that's sitting in front of you as a physician or as a healthcare provider is really the reason why you're doing this. And the journey that the person took to get into their current situation is the thing that educates you around how to deliver care to them and how to treat them in a way that actually impacts what they're experiencing. So that's great, but why do we need them with a scrub version or without the PHI involved? And the answer to that is really the efforts around real world data and real world evidence. And those that, um, you know, the very commonly used quote, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. If we can't learn from the data that we're delivering care on today, then how are we expected to deliver an improvement to that care in the future? So we can learn from those who have come before and learn from those who have had care and had experience and had positive and negative outcomes and improve the care that's delivered to them. That's really the goal. That's why we're all here. That's why we show up. Um, is to do that in an improving way and an iterative way over time so that the care we're delivering to patients is improving day to day. So in general, what are the types of data that we're talking about in this jacket? What does longitudinal mean? So we really literally mean anything, anything that's collected, monitored, recorded, observed, witnessed, experienced, or even done as a delivery of care directly to the patient. And that includes not when they're at the hospital, that includes not when they're sick, as we mentioned, it's a person. And then we really mean this as all the data. So within our conversation internally, and as we're messaging this outside, we think of it from a very broad spectrum. This could be patient generated data and things like fitness trackers or watches. This could be social determinants of health about where the patient lives or where the person lives could be financial data, a very wide range of things um, are taken into account. And all of these have sources of identity and sources of representation for how they refer to that patient. So there's a wide collection of records that need to be consolidated. So the real question in this is how do you consolidate that record into a single best record? And this is again, the same um, concepts that were discussed earlier around how you do the matching. We assign weights, we calculate the weights based on the importance of that specific value. So again, street name may mean a different thing depending on the country or the location. House number might be very different in a place with a large number of apartments versus not. Um, so there's a variety of weights that can be assigned and the differences in those individual values um, can be indicative of the signal of who is actually the same person. So there's a range of results that come out, again, with the automated matches on the ones that are very confident, and then the potential matches and then false positives that need to be reviewed by a human, um, all driving towards that actual unique record. And then from a conceptual basis, how do we do this in a federated way? How do we take that record and combine those across systems? So you may have an organization that has multiple tiers. You may have an organization or a partnership of organizations that do different things. So in this scenario, you have a facility A and a facility Q at the bottom. Um, and each of those may generate their own records and may have their own view of who a patient is. You can consolidate those and bring them up um, to a higher tier where you're bringing multiple of them in, federating them and merging them along as they're going. So they compare to each other, they build and they develop against each other. And then eventually you have at the highest level that you have available, uh, you can imagine a regional level, an HIE, um, something in the environment that has a, an aggregation of those data sources, you can present what you know is the single best record for that. So you merge it as it goes along and you present that in a way um, that tells the story of who the patient is. What we would propose is as you're looking at these types of activities to do training from and to do de-identification where you need to protect and respect the privacy of the patient, we would do this starting with that single best record, whatever that means in the organization you have. Um, rather than dealing with it at the lowest level, we would strongly recommend and propose that you deal with it at the highest level. So take the best record that you know for the individual and use that as the basis for the de-identification. Um, you have questions that may come up around it. 
Uh, do you need this data to be reversible when you do the data identification? Do you need to be able to look up and say, this patient received this type of treatment and had a negative outcome, and we found this information out later about this specific pharmaceutical that they were using, and we'd like to be able to reach out and communicate with them again to let them know about something else that came up. So there's a, a question in how you're using that data and how you would like to be able to walk back and identify the individual. So do you need to keep a local repository that has that crosswalk or the mapping? Um, and then what's the method that you're using to do the replacement of those values? Is it a hash value? Is it a, a generated key? Is it using an external service? Whatever those things are, that can be a variety of ways to solve it. And describing it this way makes it sound very, very easy, but it is not. It's very complex, and it's something that um, there's a lot of effort and a lot of work uh, in the literature, including um, the uh, National Institutes of Health has a number of recommendations around it, around how to deal with specific values and how to deal with those in a safe way for that de-identification process. So there's a reference in the PowerPoint for that as well. Um, again, this is not our, our core competency and what we focus on. It's something that we're supporting in a number of the workflows that we're working with our partners and customers on. And then the last step is um, once you've gotten the single record and you've processed it and de-identified it in the way that you'd like, you can insert that into um, the specific fire repository of your choice. Obviously, given the context of the conversation today, we have some preferences. Uh, but the goal is really to map and normalize that data on the way into the repository so that you can use it in a in a effective way so that terms coming from different places and different organizations can be standardized and normalized into a way that lets you learn from them in a common um, dictionary and a common understanding. And then the AI algorithms and the learning that comes from that can be applied and then hopefully repeating the cycle deliver better care for the patient tomorrow. Um, any questions with that or comments around it, um, I'm happy to respond uh, with emails. I'm happy to talk about what we do and how it applies to what you guys are up to as well. Uh, but I really appreciate the opportunity to talk today. And if there are any questions, I will uh, stop the, the sharing as well. I'm yeah. not sure if I was under my time or on it, but I think it, it felt like I went quickly. Yeah, you're in time. So thank you, Thomas. So, uh, uh, are you merging data? So you you said that uh, you're getting from different sources, normalizing. Are you doing some linkage and merge? Because I, I missed this in, on slides. So uh, how, how you get this consolidated record? Depending on the workflow, we help organizations who are trying to do those merges. So we may assist with the process of the manipulation of it, and we may cross-reference and we may accumulate data from other sources. So we may take something like an HL7 V2 source in one environment, translate it or assist it into the translation into a fire repository, and then use that as the basis, um, triggering the, the EMPI to identify what the record is for that context and then mapping the identities for that back into the, the values that are inserted into the repositories. Mm -hmm. So it could be a merge, it could be a combination, it could be a reference or a lookup against an external system as well. Mm -hmm. But on your practice, what, what's used mostly like merging or linking, like keeping them separated, they coming from different sources, yes, and you match them. So you're keeping them separate, but linked, or are you trying to merge to get more simplified version like consolidated record generally we will generate the single best record and then we will keep pointers to the other identities as well so we will keep the reference to all of those and allow them to stay in their own state but mm -hmm. we'll allow you to do the crosswalk to identify who else is referring to those patients and what way are they referring to them mm -hmm. so to the point again about the mrn is not dependable um all of the MRNs are not dependable and they vary a lot depending on the organizations mm -hmm. But your best record, it's one of records, yes? So you're not trying to enrich this best record with uh, information from other sources. There can be. Um, those sources can come from a variety of things. As we talked about with referential data earlier, um, that could be a credit reference score that's being called up to look at the prior address that's, that's done. So a historical data record that was imported from an external system might have the address from two years ago. So being able to have the context to understand that that record and that address also matches to the same patient that you're seeing in a new address today is useful in the context of that. It helps you make a more confident choice in what the matching is. Mm 